I'm going to play a little slide guitar for you. Robert Johnson played slide guitar in only two tunings. One would be open G and the other's open D because there's no way you can get the major tonality of that chord unless a guitar is tuned to a major chord like that. Now you can play guitar, it's like guitar in any tuning. You can play it in standard tuning if you want to. And what happens when you do that is you create a very exacting demand on the playability. You have to play each note precisely and you cannot rely on any of the surrounding notes to be consonant with the chord. So you have to very carefully play each note. Whereas in this tuning, I have a much more generous uh, field of open G notes and I tend to have less problem with conflict. Now the way that I play slide guitar here is this is normal action slide guitar. I've not done anything to raise the strings higher. And it makes it kind of demanding because you don't want to get too much fret rap when you slide across the frets. And in this style, you do not dampen the string like dobro players do where they're using their first finger to dampen the overtones behind the slide because it's just too demanding. And I follow the uh, rule of Sunhouse, which he says keep the slide moving so it never stays in one place for very long. It's always moving in or out of a note. And that way you don't have the requirement that you dampen the, fing the string with your finger to avoid the overtones coming from behind the slide. Now you might think I'm playing an open G here, but I'm not. This is the drop G, drop C variant of open G where I have this, this is actually tuned to C. allows me to have a uh, stronger C chord because I can have the C underlying this slide and also gives me a nice shuffle that's not open G and then there's this one. This is double drop D and it makes a nice slide tuning because you have basically the same structure. a good example of ciphering because if I play this tuning like this, this is my double drop D tuning, key of A, slide up here at the 14th fret. Over the tonic on the second string which is the A. Uh, 
and then you compare that to this, which I'm capoing at the second fret to correct the key, and I'm tuning the second string back to G. Now you can't tell the difference between those two slide positions. They're both at the 14th fret on the guitar. This one's coming off of capo 2. It's in the key of G, the guitar key of G, but the observed key of A. And when I did it the other way without the capo and retune this string, I'm playing in the same observed key but a different guitar key. So what I say is the notes are ciphered, they're zeroed out and they seem to be the same to the listener but not to the guitarist. The guitarist can see that the two tunings do not function in the same way and they have a different sound and tonality and it is almost impossible for the listener to understand how that happens without seeing the guitar. Another example of that is the difference between when Blake plays in open G, in which case the tonic G note is here. goes to the Sweet Papa tuning. Playing Policy Blues by Blind Blake.
That song is played in drop D, drop G tuning. So the D string is here, and the G string is here, and then the rest is like standard tuning. And that gives rise to an interesting form of the A7 chord, like this. And when you try and copy this song in standard tuning, this chord will drive you crazy because you can't find it in standard tuning. This is an A7 chord, and it's got the A7 in the root here, one note above the G string. And so you can't voice the A7 chord that way in standard tuning and you keep looking for it but you can't find it and it drives you crazy because this chord has an unusual harmonic significance that it can resolve down to the G7 which is one of Blind Blake's favorite devices and it can also serve to substitute for an F minor in the progression that goes C C7, F, F minor. This A flat 7 can replace that. And so you get this kind of thing where Blake goes. And you just can't find that re uh, resolution in, in the um, standard tuning. And another thing that's novel about open G, and I want to show you um, what an unusual effect it is to have the um, minor third on the top string. So usually uh, in standard tuning and also like in open E or open D, you have a fourth between the top two strings and it kind of makes it a straight alignment between the two notes. But in Open G, you have this minor third, which is kind of endlessly surprising. And one of the effects is it allows for this kind of unison bend where you, you're bending the fifth string up to match the note on the sixth string. And if you do this in standard tuning, it's really awkward because you have to either stretch four frets to make the bend a half note bend, or you, you make a whole note bend from a three fret span, which you can do on electric guitar, but you can't really do an acoustic. So in open G, you get this unison bend. And it's really easy to do. And so you, you, if you're trying to match that in standard tuning in uh, acoustic guitar, good luck. And you hear that in uh, Blind Lamb and Jefferson and Blind Blake. That's because you have the minor third. And so that brings up the point that in melodic tonality, which is the tonality of single notes in succession, the tuning does make a difference because lots of times when I talk to the effect uh, to music teachers about the effect of tuning, the first thing they'll claim is that it can't make any difference what tuning chords are played in. And then when they see that's wrong, they fall back on the position, well, any single note passage can be played in standard tuning just as well as in any other tuning. And that's not true because of this kind of, um, this kind of redundancy you get in open G where you begin to uh, match notes on the next string at the third fret. That's a very unusual melodic device. I heard an interesting story uh, from a professor of music and chairman of the department of music at our local community college. And he was a man who started out when he was young playing guitar and then studied piano, got a PhD in music, and became a composer for 
jazz bands. And he decided to write a suite of music for guitar. He took it to a professional guitarist and asked him to record it for him. And the guitarist told him that the music was unplayable. And I find that story very interesting because First of all, it's amazing that the professor of music did not realize that he had composed an unplayable piece of music. And second of all, I'm astounded that a professional guitarist would not know how to play something. And it, I find it curious what is the quality of music which makes it playable on guitar because in my heart, at least, I think that almost anything can be played in guitar in one way or another. Because we have this wonderful property that if you cannot play notes in a certain way, in a certain position, then there is another way on the guitar that they can be played that is better. And if there isn't, there is a harmonic substitution which will have the same meaning that will allow you to express the harmonic meaning. Now, Eric Clapton expressed the idea that you think you know how to play a guitar part and then later on you find out that isn't how it's played at all. And so that kind of gives the idea of having to search for the correct guitar arrangement. And I think the story of the professor and the professional guitarist who couldn't play the music shows that they are lacking a process for vetting music. And by that I mean for trying to find the correct home on the guitar for music because the guitar has certain peculiarities that it can't play everything in every key, but there is very often a certain key and tuning that will provide an easy and expressive home for music to be played. And it's a process of finding that home for an arrangement that that we use the musical triangles for. The musical triangles are used to navigate guitar tuning key space because there's so many tunings and so many keys that we would be lost without triangles. We would not know how to move from open G to open D or from standard tuning to dad fat. And the fact is that you can go from any tuning key to any other tuning key in one operation. And it takes three steps, but it's still one operation. And so it's uh, simply a matter of using the proper arithmetic. And you will find that if you are able to play music in one tuning and key, then you know how to play it in every tuning and key if you use the musical triangles and follow the arithmetic that they tell you. Now, the, the, the arithmetic goes in three steps. The first step is an algebraic or harmonic step, which means that you import a note into the tuning you don't care whether it's in the right place or not. You just want to find a place for the note in the tuning. That's step one. And that depends either on which tuning you start with and which tuning you're going to, or if you're just starting with pitches, then it simply depends on the tuning of the guitar you're using. And it's a simple arithmetic process you know that if the lowest string on the guitar is E, then you count up and you find a place for the note wherever that note may be. Now that note may not be particularly playable. Uh, it might not even be possible to reach, but it does represent the correct harmonic value. And then step two is to reposition the note in a logical way that makes it more playable. Now some notes, like this note here, 
has only occur in one place. We say it has a redundancy value of one. And therefore, there's no logical decision to be made. That note can only be played here, and there's no two ways about it. On the other hand, this note has two position values for the same pitch value. And so when this note occurs in arrangement, it gives me an opportunity to consider which note is more expressive or more useful or more playable. And so the process of guitar arrangement proceeds by first finding the algebraic or harmonic position and then finding the correct playable position. And then there's a third step, which is proofing. And proofing occurs when you play the arrangement up to tempo. Because if you play the notes slowly, you can probably play them in any tuning or key. But as you approach the correct tempo, having a playable arrangement becomes more and more important. And you begin to notice minor details that optimize the path of tonal movement to make it more efficient and more expressive. Now, to show how uh, musical triangles work, I'm going to change guitar. This guitar is in standard tuning, and I want to show you these chords you probably know. E, A, D. And these chords are voiced in the same way. They are harmonically the same chord. They're voiced with a fifth on top. The root or tonic in the middle and then the third on the bottom. Actually, I did that backwards. The, the fifth's on the bottom, the tonic's in the middle, and the third is on top. And if the guitar was tuned to lute tuning, which is 5-5-5-5, five, 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 then when I move the chord, it would tend to preserve its shape as I move across the strings. But this tuning standard is 5-5-4-5. Five, 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 and I call that 4 the wrinkle. It's, uh, it's a uh, slightly different tuning, and it calls for a correction. And this is a form of triangulation. It's a triangle rule that says, when I move the notes from string to string, I move every note by 5 frets except for the notes that fall on the third string and move, excuse me, fall on the fourth string and move to the fifth string. And those notes I have to add one fret number to. So in that way, the E is automatically converted to the A because I take the E shape and I add one note here when I move it across. And that becomes the A, and in the same way, the A chord becomes the D by following that rule of adding one fret to the note on the fifth string. Now, the reason I'm explaining this is because it allows me to transpose the chords without even knowing what the chords are. Usually to transpose, you say, okay, this is an E chord, and if it moves up five frets, it will become an A chord. I don't need to know what this chord is. I just need to know that it moves over and gains one fret there. And so it changes its shape. And this is why we need the musical triangles, because these are the same chords, but they change their shape. And we have this problem with guitar transposition that we don't have on the piano. Because if we move from the key of C to the key of D, the shape of the chords remains exactly the same, except for the black and white keys. They change, or the sharps and flats have change their positions. But the intervals between the notes in the key of C and the key of D are exactly the same. But on the, on the guitar, we say they are similar and equal, but not exactly the same. So, the shape of the E chord, same chord, is not the same as the shape of the A chord. And the shape of the A chord is the same chord as the D chord, but it's not the same shape on the guitar. And so, you see a similar sequence of chords that go with G. G, we move 
shift them over to the next higher set of strings and we get a C. And we move that chord over to the next higher set of strings and we get an F. And we move that over and we get a, a B flat. And so this kind of transposition by string chains is generally useful in a lot of different tunings because the guitar is nominally tuned in five fret intervals. In other words, it tends to go up and on the fifth fret move to the next string so that there's one fret for every finger. And if you follow that all the way up, you have loop tuning. The five, 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 and that's the smoothest tuning, the most continuous tuning, the simplest, most regular tuning, and it's also not a tuning that's particularly popular because it's hard to play a major chord. You, you, you get started on the major chord and you get to a certain point and the tuning is fighting you and not allowing you to make a major chord in an easy way. But it's perfectly regular and it, it might have some melodic efficiency. Presumably standard tuning is the most popular because it has the simplest scales. You don't have these gaps and overlaps that kind of make um, scales difficult. So it's kind of a confusing message to realize that the shape of the chords and scales on the guitar is entirely a function of the tuning. It's not a function of the chords that you play because if I can play the same major chord can have all these different shapes. This is basically the same chord. Those are all major chords and they all take different shapes according to where they are in the guitar. And this is a well-known geometric principle that was described by a man named Desargus. And what he said is if you take a chord, which is a root, a third, a fifth, and an octave, that, that four points on a line, and you project them, the shape that they take when they land on some place depends entirely on the projection. But the harmonic ratios are always preserved. And that means whatever shape a major chord takes on the guitar, it's still a major chord. It has the major chord intervals and obeys, obeys the laws of the major chord. Now, if you think about drop D tuning, you might be inclined to think that drop D tuning is something like this. Now, this is a capo tuning. And what I've done here is I've put the capo on the highest five strings, and I've left this bass string uncapoed so that it sounds like it's two frets lower than the rest of the guitar. And this is kind of like a, a pseudo or fake drop D tuning because it lets me play this D chord over the D tonic just like I was in drop D tuning. But I'm not required to learn a new tuning because all of the chords up here they're still played the same way that you usually play them in standard tuning and no refingering is required to play anything except for the lowest notes on the guitar. So I have this one here when I play the E. I have to remember to fret it at the capital fret. And then I got this extra two notes here that are stuck onto the tuning like a tail. They, they don't really alter the tonality in a significant way. They're just two extra notes and they don't change the relation of this string to the other notes in the tuning. So this sounds pretty much like standard tuning except when you get to the D and you got that one extra note on the D. 
And interestingly, these, these notes are in the forbidden interval range, which means that I've added these two notes, but I can't really play them uh, with any other notes on the bass string. So this fake drop detuning is really trivially different than standard tuning. And I'm using trivial there in a very specific way to mean that the guitarist is not required to relearn all the chords and scales. And this tuning is really just a derivative of standard tuning with a couple of extra notes tacked on. Now, let's see how this is different from drop D tuning. And what's happened here is the relation of this bass string to the rest of the guitar is fundamentally different. In other words, this bass string now has a different relation to every other note on the guitar and the difference is string wide. It goes up the entire string and even though the, the top five strings are still in the standard tuning, I really have to relearn all of the chords. For example, I have to learn G is played like this. The G note has moved up here. I've lost the ability to finger the B over here in a convenient way. And they have to usually deaden that string or fret it up here or find some other solution to that problem. So when I play in drop D tuning, guitarists will come up to me and they say, well, what tuning were you playing in? And I say, well, it's drop D. And they say, is that all? As though they think it's just a derivative of standard tuning. But you could equally well see this as a derivative of drop G tuning. It's also a derivative of double drop D. And you don't really understand how to play in drop D tuning unless you know these other related tunings because in drop G you pick up some techniques and you realize, oh, I could go back and apply that to drop D tuning. And if you've never studied drop G, then you won't realize that coming from standard tuning and you'll have a simplistic impression of how complicated it really is to change the tuning. Now, John Prine made an interesting observation in an interview after his, his uh, bout with laryngeal cancer and had uh, radiation to the neck. And it, he said that it took him about uh, half a year, I think, it was to recover from the radiation therapy to the point where he could sing again. And when he did that, he found that his vocal range had changed and he couldn't hit the higher notes. You know, he had some fibrosis from the radiation and his vocal cords were at a different uh, resonance. And he had to relearn his songs in different keys. And he said that when he did that, he learned the songs better. And so I call that the John Prine assertion. And that says that if you learn to play a song in a new key or tuning, you will learn to play it better. And that's what we need the triangulation for. We want to be able to change the guitar tuning and key easily without making a big deal out of it. So we can try keys out and see if we like them and see which ones are better and which ones are worse. And so that's the purpose of the triangle. And that is why we use these rules to go from one tuning to another because we can't change tuning and keys and guitar in our head like we can on piano. And I think the uh, work of Gary Davis is quite interesting in this respect because uh, Gary Davis is the father of American guitar. He left us basically a Rosetta Stone which is a set of 
blues that he uh, showed us how to play in standard tuning in a very detailed and useful way. And there's an interesting story about when Stefan Grossman was a teenager and he went over to Gary Davis's house in New York and took guitar lessons and he recorded these lessons on tape. And in one of the lessons, Stefan asked Gary Davis to play music in open G or some other tuning other than standard and Davis refuses. And Stefan asked him again, he says, well, you know, I, I want to learn something in a different tuning, can you show me how to play in another tuning? And Davis says no. And it, you can hear Stefan, he's, he's just sort of uh, pestering Davis and to the point where Davis finally says, all right, let me show you something. And he tunes his guitar to open D, and then he makes a derivative where he tunes the top string to a funny note, and he plays this song perfectly in this unusual tuning that no one has ever heard of. And he sort of put Stefan in his place. And I think that joke goes even beyond that because if you look at Gary Davis's early recordings and you try to play them with the way that Stefan Grossman has, has depicted them, what you will find is they sound great. They're wonderful arrangements. They fit together like jigsaw puzzles, but you cannot play them up to tempo. And it gives the impression that Gary Davis is uh, just an out of this world performer that can perform these pieces that just seem impossibly difficult. And what's actually going on is that those pieces are actually played in open G and open D where they're much easier to play at a higher velocity. And I, I think Gary Davis um, was kind of keeping secret the guitar, uh, the guitar schools of these different tunings and he sort of felt you would discover them on your own. Now, before I leave the, um, the subject of the G family tunings, I, I want to point out an interesting favorite key in open G which is A minor. And um, I, I think this figure, I, I trace this back to a figure that I first learned from Bert Yance in Pentangle in the 60s. It's an A minor figure and it goes, A, it has the A in the bass. Okay, so this is the Burt Yance A minor figure, and I think it ultimately goes back to Davy Graham, who was very influential in um, guitarist thinking in Britain. And so that bass line is moving over the A minor, A, G, F sharp, A, F, and eventually down to the E. And you see that line in a number of variations, um, and it kind of becomes a, a, a general concept of a bass line that descends from the tonic over a, various chords and ends up on the dominant note. This is a Led Zeppelin song, and I'm playing it in open G in the key of A minor. <laughs> Uh, kind of uh, 
arrangement that's two, two frets lower in G. showing that to you to show you what a good key A minor is in open G. It allows you to play that Bert Yance figure like this where you can fall, you start on the A, is on the second fret. <laughs> you rethink songs like While My Guitar Gently Weeped, which I think was probably the last Beatles song that I thought they played in standard tuning. So you would think that open G would be a good key for E minor since that's the relative minor have the same notes in the scale at, uh, between E minor and G major, but it there's no E string in open G and so it, you don't really have a tonic bass note that you want to spell the name of the chord but sometimes it does work out well like in um, Death Don't Have No Mercy by Gary Davis <laughs> 